Hi class and welcome to CIS 265, Information Systems Essentials. I'm Mr. Wallington and I am your facilitator instructor for this class. We're gonna have a great time. Hey, look at some of the things we're gonna cover this week uh, or this term and, and really this is kind of an overview of the whole, whole class. I'll be coming back week after week doing other videos uh, to, to coach you and help you through this. You know, one of the things that I like about uh, this school is I get to integrate two passions of mine, teaching, and the love of the Word of God uh, into one one format. And this is great because when I think about this class, especially this class, it reminds me of a scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 28, 9 and 10. It says, Who shall he teach knowledge? And of whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept. <clears throat> line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The reason I like this, because when we talk about computing and computers and operating systems and, and uh, information system essentials, that's how we have to use a building block approach, line upon line, a precept upon precept. So some of the things that I'm going to help you out with this term is some of the precepts, some of the fundamentals, some of the foundational blocks that you not only just learn how to use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office products, but you also understand some of the foundational constructs that will help launch you into other areas as you grow. Okay, let's get into this. All right, when we talk about computers and computer fundamentals, four areas that, that I really kind of boil this down to, where we talk about hardware, operating systems, software and applications, and file management. Now we're gonna walk through each of these. Uh, because when we think about the design of, it, of that computer, that laptop, that desktop that, that you work with every day, is built on those fundamental concepts. At the, at the core, at the bottom, at the base, we have what we call computer hardware. Now that's your um, uh, central processing unit or CPU, your hard drive, uh, and all of those pieces make up computer hardware. Then on top of that hardware, because we have to have hardware to be able to install an operating system. The operating system like Windows 10, and that's what we're gonna be working with a lot, but there are many, many other operating systems out there. Uh, like I, I'm a Mac guy by, by uh, choice. Uh, so I use the Mac operating systems. Also uh, Linux, all the Unix-like uh, operating systems. So, and there are many operating systems, but your operating system is software that sits on top of your hardware. And with it, then on top of that, that's where we have applications. And now here we're talking about user applications such as Microsoft, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, all your video games and things of that nature. All of these are, are pieces uh, of this continuum that we call a computer and they're all three are essential. Um, now that's your basic computer, la computer layers and we as humans, we uh, interface with applications. When computer scientists, engineers developed this construct, they did it for a reason, really lawful for security. As a user, I do not di operate directly with hardware. So as a user, for security purposes, for me to talk to hardware, I have to go through the operating system. So, and likewise, for the application to be able to use hardware functions, it is separated logically and physically by the operating system. So what I mean by that, if you wanna print something, if you're working in Microsoft Office, let's say Word, you have a document, you wanna print that document. Well, Microsoft Word doesn't talk directly to your printer or to the hardware. Microsoft Word sends a, a request to the operating system and then the operating system, let's say Windows 10, it runs a um, what we call an API, an application programming interface that talks to the hardware that tells the printer uh, to go print. It uses a protocol that says, hey, Microsoft Word is sending me some information, let me give it to the printer. But at Word doesn't talk directly to your hardware. And like I say, those are built in for security, for security purposes and for security reasons. Okay, now let's take each of these layers a little bit deeper. So when we're talking about hardware, 
really it's at, at the core of your hardware is your CPU, your central processing unit. And you may hear these terms uh, if you're not very computer savvy. If you are, you, you, you already know this anyway. Uh, two, two major um, distributors of, of, of CPUs, Intel and AMD or Advanced Micro Devices. Most, a lot of the computers we use have the, you know, the, the Intel, the Pentium processors. But what all that processor is really is a really, really, really big and fast adding machine. You're like, what? Yes, it's a big adding machine. All it is doing is crunching numbers and, and adding uh, uh, binary code or instructions uh, that we call software so that it can do and to, to make the processing. There are advantages and advantages, uh, disadvantages to both of those, whether you're an Intel guy or if you're an AMD guy. It just depends on what's your application. But for most home users and you, and you just find a laptop or a desktop for to do schoolwork, you you really aren't going to notice that big of a difference. Now, if you're a gamer or like me, I do music and video stuff, then yeah, then you get into some differences. Now, next part of this is that not <clears throat> for that CPU to operate, it has to have code. It has to have software, um, like the, the Windows, Microsoft, off the operating system. All that stuff is stored on our storage devices. And that can be a hard drive. Like I said, most of our computers have hard drives, but now more and more of us are going to SSDs or solid state drive. Now what a st solid state drive is, unlike this hard drive that has a actual platter that spins around really, really fast, kind of like a turntable. And that's, that's that little piece right there. That is the head that reads um, the, the magnetic uh, impulses that are on that disk. A solid state drive has no moving parts, very similar to a, a, a flash drive or a thumb drive. So there's, you get some advantages and disadvantages. Advantages is speed, meaning that uh, I can write and read things off of this very fast. Another advantage is size, power, and weight, what we call swap. Meaning that now, because if with this thing in here with that has to spin, that means I have to have a motor, I've got to have a lot of other electronics and servos to control this platter spinning. So the weight, the physical size and the physical weight is much more uh, than with a uh, SSD. So that's why we're moving to SSDs, thanks for te to technology. That is your storage, okay? Now, we also have memory. Let's not confuse memory and storage. This is long-term, you know. Memory, this is actually inside of your computer. We call it RAM, random access memory. And that is volatile, meaning that when I turn the power off to my computer, everything that's in memory goes away. Basically, so what happens when your CPU needs to process something, it goes to the hard drive, say, your operating system, says, hey, hard drive, I need to get this file. Hard drive says, okay, no problem, pulls it, sends it to, RAM or to, to memory internal to your computer, and now that memory feeds to the CPU because it can do it so much faster. So that's memory storage, two, di two different things that I hope you don't get confused when you're gonna go purchase your next computer. Now, I always say this, get as much memory as your wallet can stand. Now, this part right here we call the motherboard. Now, that is really where a lot of things happen. As a matter of fact, your Central your CPUs, they are mounted right here on your motherboard. That's where those things are mounted. And your memory, like I say, you've got slots on here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, that is where the memory is located. And a lot of your new computers are actually coming now where your storage is also mounted right there on that motherboard all together. So the motherboard, and, and it also has, as you just kind of look around it, you see all the pins, all the different pinouts and all the different, that's where you connect your USB and your ports and all that. Uh, has a cooling fan, all of those things sit on that motherboard. Now, when I take a look at this hardware, you know what it reminds me of? It's an analogy of a kitchen. My wife, I love my wife, she loves to cook. And if anybody loves to cook, what is the one thing you know when you walk into a kitchen? What do you want? You want space, right? You want big counter space. So here's the analogy. So let's say that my wife wants to make lumpia, okay? So, and she's got all the ingredients you need in the refrigerator. This hard drive is your refrigerator. That's long-term storage. 
our CPU is going to be my wife's cutting board that she's going to bring out and put on the kitchen counter. And speaking of kitchen counters, that is the most important part. This right here, that, that RAM, that memory, that is your kitchen counter. And if anybody cooks, what do you know? You can never have too much counter space, right? You can never, ever, ever have too much counter space. So the same thing with your computer. You can never have too much RAM. That's why I say, when you, if you're buying a new computer or if you're looking at upgrading, get as much RAM as your wallet can stand. If it can hold 64 meg, uh, gig of RAM, pack it full of RAM because that's kitchen space. Because otherwise, you're gonna work very hard. Let's say if I have a small kitchen, and I got a very small counter space. If I want to go and make this lumpia, because I got to get all the ingredients, I got to get ground beef and carrots and celery. So I go to the refrigerator, right? Boom, I pull all these things out and I'm going to bring them and set them on the counter. And so I can chop them up, chop up the, the celery and chop up that and get the ground beef ready. Well, if I got a big counter space, guess what? I can put all this stuff out there and I can work with it. I can get it going. If I have a small counter space, I can't bring all these things out. I can bring the carrots out, come over, chop those up. Now I'm gonna go back to the refrigerator and get the, the celery, come over back to the counter, chop those up. That's exactly what your computer does when you don't have enough counter space or enough memory. Your CPU is constantly having to go back to the refrigerator, back to the hard drive over and over and over and over again, which, which is a slow process because the, the, these are not do not operate as fast as that. So if you wanna in, increase the efficiency of your computer, computer, increase the RAM. Just like if you want to increase the efficiency of your cooking in your kitchen, clean off the counter, get more counter space. Does that make sense? And I make you guys going, I never would have thought that I could relate a computer to my kitchen counter. You never know what you get with me. All right. Now, so we've talked about hardware. Let's look at operating systems. Like I said, there's three major, I mean, trust me, there are way more operating systems than these, but these are the three major operating systems that we that we deal with. You know, the, the, the Windows environment, which is, you know, well known. The, then you got the, the, the people who like Mac, the Mac environment, as well as Linux. Now, I'm not gonna get into Linux, but I, I love Linux, that's always upset, because 80, 90% of the, a lot of things that we do on the internet today runs on a Linux operating system. As a matter of fact, you could probably walk around your house and you don't even realize it, you have Linux all over the place. If you've got a Roku device, your cell phones, all of those things are running on a Linux operating system. Yeah, probably your new car. If you have a, a relatively new vehicle, the uh, uh, computer, the control, all that in that is running on a Linux core in the background. Now, when we talk about the operating system, well, let's give a def definition. Operating system is a software that manages computer hardware and software resources, and it communicates with the program. Like I say, it's that interface, that middle layer that talks between your hardware and your applications. So when we, now let's, let's, let's dissect this operating system. At the, at the core of, your, of an operating system, it doesn't matter what type, if it's Windows, Mac, Linux, doesn't matter. At the heart, at the core of this operating system is what we call a kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, not C-O-L-O-N-E-L, not like in the military, but a kernel. Now what is this kernel? The kernel it is, like I said, it's a computer program that manages input and output. <clears throat> for the software. And that's what does the translation of your software instruction or your software code, does that translation for the, get it ready for the CPU. So your kernel is what is actually talking back and forth between your CPU, memory, and all your devices. I mean, that is the core, that is the heart of, of any operating system is the kernel. Um, so now, so we got a kernel. As a matter of fact, and, and, and that kernel, that's where uh, a lot of your, your, your disk operating system and things like that operate is, and, and your BIOS, your basic input output uh, system on your, on your hardware talks directly to the kernel. That's what gets your computer started when you first turn it on, because when you first turn it on, your computer's kind of stupid. It, it just has a little bit of code built into the hardware that goes out and looks for a kernel. If, and when it finds a kernel, that's when it says, oh, there's Windows 10 kernel. Hey, Windows 10 kernel, send me enough software so I can get booted and get started. That's what's happening when you first turn your computer on and you see that black screen and you see all these other things, is that kernel is loading up the software needed, the instructions needed to get your computer started. So now, 
The next layer on top of that kernel, we have, that's where we have our uh, operating system soft uh, applications. Now, please don't confuse operating system applications with user applications. And here's what I mean. At this layer, this is where we have things like uh, uh, File Explorer, um, your, your menus, all those things that you have in Windows, the, the, the menu layout, all accessories, uh, your command prompt, all of those things are what we call um, operating system applications. They're not the user app. We haven't gotten there yet. That's the next layer up. Now we have outside of that, we have uh, user applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And those are the different layers that make up the, 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 uh, your operating system and then the user applications, which is separate, that fits on top of that. So we've talked about hardware, we've talked about software. Now let's talk about the file system. This is a very interesting thing. Now, believe it or not, this sounds like Ripley's, but believe it or not, your computer doesn't could care less about a file system. And well, here's what I mean by that. A file doesn't exist for a computer. All the thing that could, could exist for a computer is, you know, like say a series of, of ones and zeros or binary numbers or software code. That file structure is there for us as humans to be able to know how to relate and find information. So, because it's because for that reason, that's your operating system creates an illusion, yes, that this file structure exists, but it really doesn't. It's just there so that we as a human, we can have a visual way to uh, interact and find information on our hard drive. Like I said, like I said from a computer's point of view, it, it, it's only looked at blocks of memory. And what am I talking about by blocks of memory? All right. Let's talk about how a hard drive works because now you can understand how a little bit more about uh, memory. Okay, let's say this is a hard drive. You remember to show you the picture earlier of the hard drive, the big platter that's spinning? Well, that's what this platter is. This thing is spinning around. So when you format your hard drive, if you remember, if you ever had to do that, when you buy a brand new hard drive, you have to format it. And what that formatting does, it sets up these circles all, you know, all the way around on that hard drive. And these circles, they're known as tracks. Every one of those circles is a track. Then it also sets up a sector. Sectors is where, where all these lines, you know, the, going across, that would be a sector. So if you look at this right here going out, that green right there, that would be a sector. You know, that would be another sector, another sector, sector. So we got tracks and we have sectors. Now where a track and a sector intersect, that is a block. Right there, that would be a block, right? And that is where your operating system writes data onto that drive, is in a block. Well, everything that's written is written into that block. And your operating system <clears throat> has a way of keeping up. It has a little database in, in that, on that disk called the boot sector. And that, that, that's what keeps up with where every block of data is stored on that drive. So when you save a file, and most of these block sizes, they're, they're fixed. You know, let's say this is 512 kilobit size. If you have a file that's a, you know, a two megabit, a two meg uh, PowerPoint. Well, what your operating system does, it breaks that two megabit up into 512 bit segments, and it writes it on different blocks across the disk. But what it does, it labels each one so it knows where to go when you wanna retrieve that file. I need to go here to get this block, I need to go here to get this block, and go here to get that block, and it puts them all back together and presents it back to you as a file. But your computer don't really care about a file. All it is, it wants to know is where those different blocks are. And that's why, you know, now one thing you're always gonna get from me in class is security. My, my background and, and what I do now is IT and cybersecurity. So from a security perspective, that's why uh, it's always important to know when you delete a file on your computer, you are not deleting the file. Here is all you're really doing. Remember I told you that each one of these blocks, your operating system, it, it numbers it and it puts a little, uh, little tick to, so it knows where to go. When you delete a file, all you're doing is deleting that little number. 
So now the next time your computer comes to this spot, it thinks that this is empty because it doesn't see the little number that says there's data there. But the data is still on the disk. So that's why just deleting a file off of your hard drive does not, the data doesn't go away. Uh, the only time it's going to, is it, 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 you won't be able to find it is the next time it comes and it, it writes over the top of it. But we have software now that where we can go six or seven layers deep to find data that's been written on a drive. So if you think that just by deleting the file that you've cleared it, you have not. So if you're going to get rid of a hard, say if you're going to give a computer away, well, you, you want to be sure that your hard drive, especially if you've had sensitive information on there or financial information or your personal information, before you give that computer away to somebody else, to your cousin, to your neighbor, you want to be sure that you have either do one of two things, take the hard drive out and put a new one in there for them, or be sure that you wipe and you sanitize this hard drive completely so that all of your data because otherwise their 15 year old son is gonna be sitting there going and pulling up old files that, because they're software that you can go and extract that data. So before you give a laptop desktop away, be sure that you sanitize that drive because your date, those blocks can still be recovered. Okay, all right, what else are we gonna talk about? as we talk about this file system. So when we think about this file system that we, I say this is just kind of a pictorial of, of File Explorer that's in Windows. I say, so you got a hard drive, you got the hardware, which is storage, operating system, that controls, that is what sets up the illusion of folders and files. But on this drive right here, this does not exist. This only exists in our minds and on the screen, okay? <laughs> So yeah, so remember that. This is just an illusion because this is only looking at blocks of data, blocks of information. And these are some of the, the, the attributes or some of the things that this file system does. Like I said, keeps tracks of where, you, where they're stored, determines how the files are stored. Let's also, it manages the amount of available uh, memory, uh, storage that you've got left on there, and it allocates memory and storage space uh, for the files. Okay, now let's talk about the last thing, applications, because this is really gets to what we do, this class is about, uh, is user applications. And we're now we're gonna kind of focus in on Windows because this class is built around um, Microsoft Office products. When we look at Windows, and Windows 10 especially, I mean, they're really trying to go to where you have one um, uh, application, one, operating system that operates across multiple, multiple platforms, whether it's desktops, whether it's like your Surface tablet, uh, game consoles, you know, uh, Xbox, whatever it may be. So when we look at Windows 10, this is just a quick, if you're not familiar with it already, this is just a very quick tutorial on just how to navigate Windows 10. Some of the things to be aware of, like say, you know, your start menu, that's what the little, the little, little uh, Windows icon takes you to the start menu. This is just search. And you can just pretty much type anything in there, like R-U-N, and it's going to run. It's going to then find the, the, the closest match to that. This is your taskbar. The good thing to remember about your taskbar, you can pin stuff to it. I love that feature, that you can pin things to your stats, to your uh, taskbar, things that you use a lot. You know, let's say if you have a Microsoft, if, you, if you're using Microsoft Word all the time, when you have Word open, go down to your taskbar. You'll see the Word icon down there, that little, the graphic. Right click on that and it says, or it's got pin to taskbar, and that way. Microsoft Word will stay down there all the time so you don't have to go find it again. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, some navigation. So like I said, so now when you click on uh, the start menu, this takes you to your desktop. This is where you've got your, you know, again, more icons for your desktop if you need to get to uh, different applications. <clears throat> if you right click on the start menu, now this gives you a lot of other options, you know, like your task manager settings, if you need to get to file explorer, all of those things just by right clicking on your mouse, it'll pop, pull that piece up. All right, guys, listen, that was just a quick introduction on hardware, software, file management, and just a brief opening up on applications and really looking at Windows 10. Um, stay tuned because next we're gonna go into word processing with uh, Microsoft Word. And yes, yeah, so if you feel like singing hallelujah, please go right ahead. Hope to see you next week. If you have any questions or anything, please contact me, email, text, I'm available. Have a great day. God bless.